Okay, thanks, thanks very much for uh, that introduction. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the contextual bandits problem. Uh, so uh, just to start off with something concrete, I thought I'd give a kind of motivating example of where the kind of problem we're going to be looking at comes up. Uh, so if you design a website, then uh, the website uh, needs to decide on the content or the advertisements that will be presented to each web user as he or she arrives. So um, what happens repeatedly is the website is visited by a user and that user generally shows up with some kind of profile uh, you know, or some browsing history. In other words, you know something about the user typically. Uh, then the website has to decide on an advertisement to present to the user or a newspaper article or some other content to present to the user. And then finally the user responds in some way. So the user uh, clicks or leaves the page or um, whatever. And the goal, of course, is to make choices that will elicit some kind of desired behavior. So most typically you, the website wants to try to get the person to click as much as possible, as often as possible. Uh, so here's another example. So this example is to medical treatment. So the other example is a very realistic example. This one is maybe a little bit uh, more science fiction-y, but whatever, it's, it still brings across the main ideas. Um, so in medical treatment, what happens is that repeatedly a doctor is visited by a patient. And then again, of course, the doctor knows something about that patient. So the doctor knows about the person's symptoms and test results and the person's age and gender and so on. And based on all that information, the doctor needs to decide on a treatment, prescribes a drug, uh, does nothing, uh, whatever. And then the patient responds in some way. So maybe the person gets better or gets worse or never comes back. And that happens, you know, repeatedly. And the goal, of course, is to make choices that will uh, maximize favorable outcomes. You want patients to get better. Okay, so both of these are examples of what we call the contextual bandits problem, what's called the contextual bandits problem. Uh, so what's happening is repeatedly some kind of agent, like the doctor or the website, uh, needs to decide on an action. So in this talk I'm going to be call, calling that agent a learner, since I come from machine learning and anything interesting is done by a learner. So the learner repeatedly is presented with some kind of context, like information about the patient or the web user. Then the learner decides on an action, like um, prescribing a drug. And then finally the learner observes some kind of reward, uh, where that reward could be positive or negative. We're thinking of it as a real number. But importantly, the learner only gets that reward for the action that was actually chosen. That's what makes this a bandit problem. The bandit name come, comes about for historical reasons uh, from an older problem called the multi-armed bandit problem. Uh, and this version of it is called the contextual bandits problem because of the context, of course. Okay? Um, so this happens repeatedly and the goal is to learn to choose actions to maximize the rewards. So what we claim is that this is a very general and fundamental problem. It's really the problem of how to learn to make smart choices, smart decisions, intelligent behavior through experience. Okay, so what are some of the issues that come up with this? Uh, so first of all, there's a classic dilemma which comes up in any bandit problem. Um, it's often called the exploitation versus exploration dilemma. So on the one hand, the learner wants to exploit what has already been learned so as to behave in a way that will maximize rewards based on what's already been learned. That's exploitation. But on the other hand, if you always act in the way that you think is best based on your experience, you might be missing out on other great ways of behaving, new drugs to be discovered, whatever. Um, 
And so we also need to be doing some exploration so that we can learn new behaviors. We can learn behaviors which might give better results. So that's the first dilemma, how to balance between those two. Um, in addition, in the contextual bandits problem, we have to use the con we want to use the context as effectively as possible. So when you have context, there are just many, many more ways of behaving. There are many possible ways of behaving, in other words, of choosing actions, choosing how you'll make decisions based on context. And so there's just a lot more possible behaviors to consider. Um, and of course, it's very unlikely that you're going to see the same context twice, or maybe you'll see the same patient a few times, but in general, you're dealing with a large collection of patients, um, all of which might be different. So what that means is you can't be learning separately for each context. We have to figure out a way of generalizing across contexts. And another important issue or problem we'll have to deal with is selection bias because we're going to be trying to gather statistics through exploration, but we're also exploiting at the same time. So you're both gathering statistics while trying to maximize reward, while trying to behave in a smart way. And that means that the statistics that you are gathering will be very highly biased. You're getting this very highly skewed data. And so somehow we have to deal with that. And then finally, we want our methods to be efficient. We care about space and time efficiency. Okay, so these are some of the issues that make this a challenging problem. So in this talk, I was told that this is a broad scientific audience, so I'm going to try to give an introductory overview of some of the algorithms and techniques that have been developed for this problem. And I'll also talk about some of the variants on this basic problem. Uh, what we're aiming for are algorithms that are very general purpose and practical, so they should be fast. We want them to be easy to implement. And we want them to be capable of learning complex behaviors. We want to be able to learn complex ways of choosing actions based on context. And we also want these algorithms to have nice statistical properties. We want them to be provably um, as uh, statistically efficient as possible. Okay. Okay, so here's a quick outline. And maybe I should say to feel free to ask questions. Here's a quick outline. So first I'll start by formalizing what the learning problem is here. Uh, then the main part of the talk will be about algorithms and techniques. And then depending if there's time, uh, I'll uh, talk about an application of this and a next step. Okay, so starting with formalizing the learning problem. So let me start by giving a formal model or a formal presentation of the problem that I already talked about. So this is really the same problem that I talked about before, but just with some math notation filled in. So we've got this process which is repeating. So there are capital T rounds or trials uh, in which this is happening. And on each round, little t, what happens is that the learner observes some context that will denote xt, and then the learner selects an action at. And to make things simple, we'll assume that the actions, that there are k possible actions, where k is, you know, think of k as not too big a number, 10, maybe 100 possible actions, and we'll just number those actions 1 through k. And then the learner observes a reward, a real valued <coughs> reward, importantly, for the one action that was selected. Yes. So let me say where the rewards come from. Okay, so this is, okay, let me say what RT is. Okay, I'm actually leaving out a step here. There's another step in here, which is that before the learner selects an action, nature or the world or the environment, whatever you want to call it, selects a reward vector. In other words, selects the rewards that would be received for each one of the k possible actions. And by the way, we're assuming that the rewards are in a bounded space, let's say between 0 and 1. Okay, so this reward vector 
is chosen, this set of rewards for any possible action that the learner might take, are chosen by the world before the learner selects an action, then the learner selects an action and the learner gets to see what the reward is for that action. Okay, so to answer your question, this notation looks like a function, but don't think of it as a function. It's, it's a vector that was chosen beforehand, okay? Okay, and the goal, at least the goal for now, I'm going to refine this, but the goal is to maximize the total reward, the sum of the rewards that would be received for the action selected. Okay, now, for now, for now, I'm going to assume that these, these contexts and these reward vectors are being chosen at random at every time step independently from one trial to the next, okay? So I'm not, I'm not saying that the context xt and rt are independent of each other. That would mean the context carries no information about the rewards. On the contrary, we expect these to be very highly correlated and we expect that the context will be informative in choosing which action gives highest reward. I'm just saying from one round t to another, for now, we're assuming that everything is independent, okay? Okay, so just to make this concrete, here's a little toy example. Uh, so in this example, there are three possible actions. So on the first round, uh, let's say a web user shows up, and we have a description of that web user. He's male, he's 50 years old, and so on. And then nature chooses the rewards for each one of the three possible actions. And, of course, that's not revealed to the learner. Then the learner selects one of those actions, so the learner maybe selects action two, gets to see the reward for action two, but not for the other actions, and receives that reward. And then we go on to the second round, another context shows up. Uh, nature chooses the rewards for each action. The learner selects an action, gets a reward, and so on. Okay, so the learner is building up the sum of rewards that it's trying to maximize. Okay, so the learner is trying to figure out how to choose actions based on context. In other words, what the learner is trying to do is the learner is trying to find a rule, a decision rule, for selecting, sel selecting action from the context. Okay, a rule for selecting action from the context. And we call that kind of a rule a policy. It's called a policy. Okay, so the learner is trying to find a good way of choosing actions from context. So just to make things concrete, here's an example of a possible policy that the learner might uh, try to use to select actions. Um, and again, this is just meant as an example. I'm not saying that we always use policies that look like this. But what this policy does is given a context, let's say a web user, this rule says, if the web user is male, then choose action two. Otherwise, if she's over 45, choose action one. Otherwise, choose action three. So the point is it just gives us a way of selecting actions based on context when a new context comes in. And the learner is trying to learn a policy of that kind. So a policy, again, need not have this form in general. A policy is really just a function that maps any context to an action. That's all it does. It gives us a way of selecting an action. And where do these policies come from? Well, before learning begins, we as the algorithm designer needs to decide on the general form of the policies that we'll be using. And really, this is just like what happens in, machine, in all kinds of areas of machine learning where before you do any learning, you need to decide ahead of time what kind of a rule you're using. So you might decide to use a decision tree or a neural network or a linear classifier and so on. So in the same way as the algorithm designers, we need to decide on the form of the policies that will be used. Which is to say that we need to decide on a policy space, a space of functions, a space of policies that, um, that we'll be using. 
okay? So for example, we might de decide to use decision trees. In that case, the policy space would be the space of all decision trees. A decision tree, if you haven't seen it, is just a nested if-then-else rule like this. That's all a decision tree is, okay? Just as an example. So tacitly, what we're doing when we decide on a policy space is we're making an assumption. We're making an assumption that there is some policy, some rule in that space which will give high reward. And of course, as the algorithm designers, we don't know if that'll be correct or not, but it's something that where we use our background knowledge and our intuition and so on to make that decision, okay? Okay, so those are policies and policy spaces. So the goal then, once we've decided on a policy space, is to learn through experimentation to do as well as the best policy in the space, or almost as well as the best policy in that space. So in other words, if there is one policy in the space, which is good, which gives high reward, then our aim is to come up with a learning algorithm which will perform nearly as well as that best policy. Okay, that's how we're formulating the problem. So in general, we're, I, not in general, but for simplicity, it's not in general, but for simplicity, I'm gonna be assuming that this policy space is finite, but even though it's finite, we're typically thinking of it as being extremely large, a huge space, like the space of all decision trees, which is and a huge space, okay? So we're thinking of this space as being exponentially large, exponential in whatever complexity measure you want, okay? But a huge space, but finite. And by allowing that space to be so huge, we're allowing for the possibility of learning behaviors which might be very complex behaviors, which can express complex ways of choosing actions from context. Okay, and the hope is that this is gonna be a very powerful approach. But there are challenges, of course, okay? There are challenges when dealing with this really, really large policy space. Because when you have a very, very large policy space, we need to be learning about all of the policies at the same time while simultaneously trying to perform as well as the best one. And when an action is selected, we only get to observe the reward for policies that would have chosen that same action. If a particular policy would have chosen a different action, we don't know what reward it would have received. So in other words, it's the same exploration versus exploitation dilemma, but now it's on a gigantic scale. It's on a gigantic scale because you're trying to learn as well as the best policy in this gigantic space. Okay, so we can go back to this formal model and we can make it more precise. So this first part is unchanged, exactly what I had before. But now we can refine what the goal is. Before I said vaguely that the goal is to get high total reward. So now to make that more precise, what we really want is to get high total or equivalently, equivalently high average reward relative to or in comparison to the best policy in the policy space. So if there's one good policy, then this learning algorithm should also perform well, even if we don't know what it is when we start out. Okay, so we can measure that difference in performance by what's called the regret. So this is the regret, don't worry too much about the math, but basically this term is the average reward of the learner, just averaged over the capital T trials. And this is the average reward of the best policy in this space, capital Pi. And so the difference is the difference in performance. And what we want is for that regret to be small. In particular, we want the regret to go to zero as the number of trials gets large, which means that the performance of the learner is getting very close to the performance of the best policy. And if we can do that, we call it a no regret learning algorithm. Okay, so that's, that's the learning model. That's a description of the learning problem. So what I wanna do next is to start talking about algorithms and techniques for solving this problem. And in fact, 
This part is broken up into two parts. Uh, the first part is the full information setting. I'll say what that is in a minute, and then we'll come back to the bandit setting. Okay, so as I said, we'll start with the full information setting. So <clears throat> to make things simpler, what I want to do is to start out by supposing that the learner actually gets to see the rewards for all of the actions, not just the action that was actually selected. Okay, so in terms of medical treatment, that would mean that when the doctor prescribes a drug, he also finds out not only what happened with that drug, but what would have happened with a host of other treatments. Of course, this is not at all realistic in uh, medical treatment, but let's just go with it, okay, to build intuition. Okay, so the picture is like this. Again, a context arrives. Nature chooses a set of rewards. The learner chooses an action. But now what's different is that the lear learner also gets to see what reward would have been received by all of the actions, including the ones that were not selected. Okay, so this process goes on just as before. Now what makes this setting nice, what makes it nice is we can pick any particular policy and figure out what rewards would have been received for that policy. Okay, so we can pick a particular policy pi, let's call it, and we can go back and we can compute what actions would have been selected by that policy on each one of these contexts. It's just a function, so we can figure it out. Did you have a question? Yeah, I assume that Yes, after the action is chosen, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can figure out what action would have been selected by that policy. And since we can observe all the rewards, we can also figure out what reward would have been received for each one of those actions. Okay, so we can figure out the total reward that would have been received if we had listened to that one policy all the way through. And of course we can do that for all of the policies. And that's nice because if we just take the average of these numbers, the average of these, that average is a good estimate of the policy's expected reward. Remember, we're in a random model, an IID model, okay? So that we can talk about expected reward, and this average is going to be a good estimate of the expected reward. So there's a really obvious thing to do here, which is just you've got a policy space, you can compute the reward, the total reward of all of them, just pick the best one, right? So we call that simple algorithm the follow the leader algorithm. So in follow the leader on every round, all we do is we find the empirically best policy, the one that's performed the best so far in terms of its chosen actions, and then we use that policy on the current context to select the next action AT. That's the whole algorithm. Okay, this algorithm gives optimal regret. So the regret of this algorithm is like square root log number of policies divided by t. So this means that the regret is going to zero at the rate one over square root of t. Okay, so it's a no regret algorithm. And you can see it's only logarithmic in the number of policies, which is what we want because we want to be able to deal with these exponentially large policies. So statistically this is great, but what about computation? Well, the main challenge in terms of computation is this step. How do we find the best policy in the space? Now there's no general answer to that, but what we need, what we need to implement this really simple algorithm is we need a method for finding the best policy in this space. Okay, so we, we're calling that procedure, whatever it is, an oracle. We're just calling it an oracle. I realize in statistics, oracle means something a little bit different, and in any case, it sounds like a mysterious word. But all I mean by miracle, oracle, <laughs> okay, oracle is not a miracle, an oracle is um, just an algorithm or a subroutine for finding the best policy in this space, the best one, on the context and rewards that were actually observed. 
Okay, so if we have an oracle like that, then we can use it to implement this algorithm. Um, so we call this oracle an argmax oracle. It's also called the ERM oracle, classification oracle, and so on. The important point is not what it's called. The important point is that this oracle is actually doing something that's really natural in machine learning. So we've been talking about things like actions and policies and so on. But in fact, all that's happening here with this oracle is it's solving a very standard kind of learning problem called a classification learning problem, where you're trying to classify objects according to their category. Okay, so if we change the name of everything, change the names of policies and actions and contexts, we just end up with a very standard kind of classification learning algorithm. And that's great because people have been working on that problem for decades. And so by now we have all kinds of methods that we can use here. Uh, we can use um, support vector machines and decision tree algorithms like CARD and C4.5. We can use uh, boosting. We can use neural networks. There I said it. So can I, I said deep neural nets. Whew, okay. But seriously, if you have a good classification algorithm sitting around for the policy space, then we can use it in place of this oracle. Okay? I saw a hand go up. Yeah? So would the target for the classification algorithm be whether or not learner chose the best action to maximize the reward for that given subroutine? Or uh, the, the target or the label would be just the action. Okay. Would just be the action. Yeah, so I, did, um, I, I wasn't going to, going to go into technical details, but basically policy corresponds to a classifier and context corresponds to an example or instance, and then the actions correspond to the labels or the classes. Yeah, and it just ends up being a straight mapping. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of highlight techniques as they come up, the kind of general techniques that are coming up. And even though this is such a simple algorithm, there are a couple techniques that come out of it. The first is to estimate the expected reward of each policy from empirical data, which we're doing. And another technique is to use an existing method, an oracle, as I'm calling it, to find the best policy. Okay, two techniques that we'll come back to. Okay. Uh, let's see. By the way, what time am I supposed to stop? I know I st was supposed to start 10 minutes late. Okay. Okay, so maybe I won't talk about proof ideas. Proof ideas just to show that every policy's empirical average is close to its expected reward, and then you just do a little math and you get a regret bound. Um, let me move on. Um, so, uh, so far we assumed a stochastic setting where the context and rewards are chosen IID independently and identically distributed on every round T. But that's not always realistic, like you could have correlations in the data, you could have drifting data, or you could be in a truly adversarial setting, like in a game playing setting. So sometimes it's nice to work in a setting where you don't make these uh, stochastic assumptions. That's called a non-stochastic or an adversarial setting. So in that case, the contexts and rewards can be entirely arbitrary. They might not be assumed to be random, and they might even be chosen by an adversary. Um, so in that case, follow the leader will not work. Um, it's not that hard to come up with an examples where an adversary can cause the learner, a learning algorithm like follow the leader, to suffer very low reward, to have very low reward, while at the same time making sure that at least one of the policies actually does have high reward. So in that way you're forcing large regret. So follow the leader will not work here. Uh, but there's another algorithm that will work here, um, which is called Hedge. Um, Hedge is the algorithm I did with Joab Freund, but it's really based very directly on the weighted majority algorithm of Littlestone and Parmuth. 
Uh, so in hedge, what we do is we maintain one weight, one real valued weight for every policy in the space. And on every round, what we do is we first choose one policy at random with probability proportional to those weights. So in other words, we normalize the weights and then we just choose a policy at random according to that distribution. And then we use that policy to select an action just like we did before. Okay, so we just use the weights to choose a policy and use the policy to choose an action. And then once we observe the rewards, we can increase the weight of every policy according to the reward that was received. So the higher the reward, the more we increase the weight of the policy. Okay, so over time you're putting more and more weight on the better policies. Very simple algorithm. This algorithm also yields optimal regret, same regret as follow the leader, but now it does it even in the adversarial setting, which is really nice. But the problem with this algorithm is that it's, it needs to maintain a weight for every single policy. So at least naively, the time and space requirements of this algorithm grow linearly with the size of the policy space, so it's just going to be too slow and generally infeasible if this space is gigantic. Um, actually, maybe I'll skip that since I'm a little behind in time. Okay, but uh, so here we've gotten another technique. The technique is to use a weighted combination of the policies, another very useful technique. Okay. So the way you prove an amazing result like this um, is to use the technique used by Littlestone and Varmut, which is to keep track of the sum of the weights of all of the policies. And it turns out it's possible to prove an upper bound on the sum of the weights in terms of the reward of the algorithm. And you can also prove a lower bound on the sum of the weights in terms of the reward of the best policy. And then when you combine those bounds, you get a regret bound. Okay, so comparing these two. So, in, so follow the leader is for the stochastic setting. Hedge is for non-stochastic. They both give optimal regret. One is efficient if given access to an oracle. The other is inefficient if the policy space is gigantic. Um, is it possible to do both? Is it possible to get an algorithm which has no regret and is efficient given access to an oracle and which works in an adversarial setting? Uh, the answer appears to be no. It appears to be impossible. This is due to Hazan and Corin. I say appear because every time I ask a lot uh, Hazan, the first author, we always have this long discussion. Do, do we show that? Do we show Anyway, so I, I think the answer is it's impossible. Okay. Okay, so moving on to the bandit setting. Okay, so in the bandit setting, of course, we only see rewards for the actions that were taken. Okay, so again, the setting is the same as the full information setting, but the learner does not get to see rewards for actions that were not taken. So the learner can still compute its own total reward. But what happens if we try to do what we did before with follow the leader? Well, we can pick a policy pi, and we can figure out what actions would have been taken by that policy. But of course, we don't get to see the rewards for all of the actions that were taken by the policy. So on round one, maybe this policy to, would have taken action three, but since the learner did not pick action three, the learner picked action two, we don't get to see what reward would have been received by the policy. So we only get to see the reward for a policy if it happened to take the same action as the learner. Okay, so we can't do what we did before. We might like to use an oracle in the way we did before for follow the leader, but there are some real problems with it. The problems are that we only get to see some of the rewards for any particular policy. And in addition, the rewards that we do get to see will be very highly biased because, again, we're choosing actions to 
maximize reward and that means the statistics we're gathering will be very highly skewed. Okay, so in case it's not clear already, exploration is really important in the bandit setting. So just to drive that home, just as a little tiny concrete example, imagine that we're considering two drugs and the truth is that the first drug, drug A, is pretty good. Maybe it has a cure rate of 60%. Drug B is a lot better. It's got a cure rate of 80%. But what can happen in early trials is it's possible, it's possible um, that just by chance, the first drug might start to look better than the second drug. Drug A might look better than drug B, even though B is actually better. And if that happens, an algorithm like follow the leader will get stuck and will only pick A. It'll say, oh, A looks better than B, so I'm only going to try drug A, which means the statistics for drug A get better and better, but the statistics for dr drug B stay lousy because we're not trying it. Okay, so we get stuck. It becomes a vicious cycle where we're only picking drug A. So the point is that we need exploration, all the more so when you have these complex policies. So in fact, we can use a modified form of uh, follow the leader, which is called epsilon greedy or epoch greedy by uh, Langford and Zhang. Um, uh, so this is like follow the leader, but we now have this explicit exploitation and exploration. So the algorithm is like this. So on every round, we choose actions in one of two ways. So with 99% probability, I'm letting epsilon be 1%, so with 99% probability, we'll just choose the best policy so far in the same way as follow the leader. And then with 1% probability, we'll just choose one of the actions uniformly at random. Okay, so this first part is explicitly doing exploitation using what we've learned so far. And the second part is explicitly doing a form of exploration. And by the way, this first part, as with follow the leader, we can do efficiently if we have access to an oracle. So this is an oracle efficient algorithm. So it's simple, it's fast if we have an oracle. The pro and its anal analysis is a lot like follow the leader. The problem with it is that the regret you get is not optimal. So the regret you get if you choose epsilon carefully is like k, the number of actions, times log number of policies, divided by t, the number of rounds, but now to the one-third power. So the optimal regret would be the same, but with square root rather than cubic root. Okay, so mm, that's too bad. But we did introduce a new technique here, which is to do explicit exploration by doing this uniform sampling of actions some of the time. Okay, what about, oh, okay, so another problem I brought up quite a bit is selection bias. So let's talk about selection bias for a minute. Um, so I've been saying that bias is such a big problem, but actually there's a very simple and old trick for dealing with bias, which is called inverse propensity weighting. Um, so just to illustrate what this technique is, very simple. Suppose we want to estimate the expected value of some random variable x. Okay, so let's say this is probability an unfair coin comes up heads. So x is 1 of heads, 0 of tails. And to make it more interesting, let's suppose that we only get to observe x with probability p. So we observe x with probability p once, and otherwise, with probability 1 minus p, we don't get to observe x at all. We don't get to get any observations of this random variable, which is kind of like the setting we have in the bandit setting. For any particular action, you might get to see the reward for that action, but you might not, and it's with some probability. Well, there's a trick we can use here. We can define a new random variable, let me call it x hat, which is just equal to x, so the observed outcome of this coin flip, let's say, divided by p, the probability we got to observe it, 
if we actually got to observe it, or zero otherwise. Okay, so it's, even though we only some of the time get to observe x, what's nice is we can always observe x hat. x hat is always observed in all cases. And what's also nice is that the expected value of x hat is the same as the expected value of x. You probably can do the calculation in your head to see that. Okay, so x hat gives us an unbiased estimate of the expected value of x. So it's a nice little trick and we can use it in the bandit setting to get unbiased estimates for the rewards of all of the actions, not just the actions that were observed. Okay. So great, we can get these unbiased estimates. Does that mean we're done? Well, no, absolutely not, because if you're not careful, the variance of these estimates might be extremely large. So even though I've been talking about bias as being the problem, bias actually is not the problem. We can get unbiased estimates. The real problem is controlling the variance of those estimates. Okay, and sometimes we can do that just with uniform sampling of actions, and sometimes we need something more sophisticated. Okay. Okay, so another technique, inverse propensity weighting to get unbiased estimates. Okay, so what about the non-stochastic setting? So Epoch Greedy was for the stochastic setting. What about bandits in an adversarial setting? Well, in that setting, there's an algorithm called XP4 uh, for contextual bandits in an adversarial or non-stochastic setting. So this algorithm combines three things I've already talked about. It combines hedge, so it's a lot like hedge, but we also combine it with uniform sampling of actions, which actually is sometimes optional depending on the particular learning problem you're looking at. And finally, we also use this inverse propensity weighting. So if you combine all those and you do things carefully, uh, you can get the optimal regret, which is the same as what we had for epoch greedy, but with a square root rather than a cubic root. Okay, and of course this also works for adversarial data, not just stochastic data. Okay, and the analysis is a lot like hedge, but we also have to worry about variance. Okay, but the problem with it is that again, just like hedge, the time and space are linear in the size of the policy space, so we're not getting efficiency. Okay, so to summarize these quickly, or to compare them, Epoch Greedy is for stochastic setting, XP4 is for the non-stochastic setting. Epoch Greedy gives you a regret bound which is not optimal. It's like one over cubic root of T. And it's efficient if we have access to an oracle, whereas with XP4 we do get optimal regret, like one over square root of T, but it's not efficient. So these differences in regret might not look so big, one third, one half, what's the big deal? But these, these really are big differences, okay? They really are big differences. So to get a regret of epsilon, where epsilon is some small positive number, in the first case we would need like one over epsilon cubed examples, whereas for XP4 we would only need like one over epsilon squared trials. So that's a big difference in the amount of data that you need to get an equivalent performance, equivalent statistical performance. So can we get both? So if we're in the stochastic setting, is there an algorithm which is fast with an oracle but gives optimal or near optimal regret? And the answer is yes. So let me explain that last. This is the last algorithm I'll talk about, uh, which is called, well, its official name is I loved con bandits. I don't remember where this name comes from, but we mostly call it by its nickname, which is Mini Monster. Actually, there's at least one co-author in this, so oh well, I won't point him out to see if he knows, remembers why we called it that. Anyway, so in this Mini Monster algorithm, 
basically apply all of the techniques that I've talked about so far, all of the techniques I've talked about so far. And in particular, just like in hedge, we need to compute a weighted combination of the policies. Hedge uses a weighted combination of policies and this algorithm does also in the same way. But now we're going to find the weights in a different way. We're going to look for the weights and we're going to start by writing down a set of properties that we want those weights to satisfy. We're going to write down two constraints that we want those weights to satisfy. So first of all, we want the weights to give us a combination of policies which gives us low regret, low regret according to our current statistical estimates. In other words, we just want to choose actions that we think will give high reward. And on the other hand, we want to choose, we want to be choosing actions in a way that controls variance. We also want to get low variance on our estimates that we're getting now and which we'll be using in the future. So we want to make sure that our future estimates are accurate by controlling the variance now. So we can write both of these down as constraints mathematically and these just correspond directly to exploitation and exploration. Uh, in the first case, you know, you're just trying to get high reward. That's exploiting what you've already learned. In the second case, you're trying to make sure that your estimates in the future will be accurate and you're doing that by doing a form of exploration. Okay, so we can write down what these constraints are. We can formulate it as this big optimization problem. It's not actually an optimization problem. It's a constraint satisfaction problem. But in any case, the important thing is that it's really big and really complex. By really big, I mean you have exponentially many variables. And even though I wrote this as two constraints, when you break them down, you actually have exponentially many constraints as well. So it's a huge uh, optimization problem. But nevertheless, we're able to solve it using a very simple and very efficient algorithm provided that we're given access to an oracle. The main idea of the algorithm is just to find a violated constraint and fix it and repeat until done. But of course the interesting part is uh, coming up with an algorithm which is simple and which is guaranteed to converge quickly. Uh, so once you do all that, the regret of this algorithm is almost optimal, so we get that square root. We also get some log factors that I'm hiding with the soft O notation. That's why I say almost optimal. And it's really fast. So it's really fast in the sense that we can measure how fast it is by how often it calls the oracle because that's the real computational bottleneck. And it's calling this oracle less than once per round, less than once per round. So it's calling the oracle on average about square root of k over t log number of policies times, so like one over square root of t times per round, or said differently, about once every square root of t rounds. Oh, I hate when people ask that question. <laughs> Yeah, the bigger the policy space, the less often you call the oracle. I don't know why that is. I don't know. We made up some reasoning of after the fact of why that is, and I don't think we were that convinced. So it's basically, you know, you set things up and you have these um, different things you have to trade off, and when you work out the trade-offs, this is what you end up with. And, um, you know, you are getting a certain amount of uh, information every time you call the oracle, which will be more if you have the policy space. So a bigger policy space, so maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? The number of oracle calls you make to get to a certain regret. Oh. Um, Does that go up? Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I guess I can't do that in my head. But yeah, maybe, maybe that, that's a nicer way of looking at it. I'll think about that afterwards. That's a good, yeah, the number of rounds to get a particular act, um, regret. 
Okay, good. So this, this technique that we're using is based on previous work by Dudik et al. Um, their algorithm was called officially randomized UCB, but it was a rather complex algorithm. It was complex enough and the methods were complex enough that it came to be called the monster paper or the monster algorithm. So that's where it, that's where it comes from. Um, so this, this mini monster is, is much simpler and a lot faster. So whereas this previous method was calling the oracle something like t to the fourth times every round, uh, ours again is only calling the oracle less than once per round. Okay, so the technique here is to formulate the desired properties in the form of an optimization problem and to solve it. Okay, so uh, oh, let me say a word about the, 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 how we prove this. So to prove the regret bound, we can prove the regret bound just using the constraints directly. So uh, um, the regret constraint, meaning that first constraint that I had up before, basically ensures that we'll be getting low regret provided that we have good estimates of the reward of every policy. And the variance constraint ensures that we actually can get estimates that will be good enough. This assumes that we can solve the optimization problem. Um, and then to prove that we can solve the optimization problem and to drive bounds on how e its efficiency, how fast it is, how many times you have to call the oracle, um, we use a potential function that measures the progress of this algorithm. And we show that every time every iteration of this numerical algorithm that we're using to solve the optimization problem causes us to make a good amount of progress and the total of prog amount of progress we need um, to solve it is bounded and so that gives us a bound on how fast it is. Okay, so it seems like I'm out of time. Uh, so let me just mention an application and, and then I'll stop. Uh, so um, some people in our lab in New York and uh, elsewhere in Microsoft uh, have created a system that basically implements contextual bandit problems. They call it the multi-world testing decision service. And this is a system, a computer system, um, it's meant to be general purpose and modular, so you can use all different kinds of contextual banded algorithms, use it for all kinds of applications, um, and they, um, they've set it up so that it's really easy to interface with an existing system. When I say a system, I mean, you know, a real system, like, you know, what's running um, the Microsoft, the MSN website, for instance, which is one place it's been used. And it's especially been designed to reduce common errors. You'd be surprised how hard it is to collect data in a reliable way. And so by creating this system, they've eliminated a lot of the problems in, in creating these systems. And in particular, it's been deployed uh, to select news articles on the MSN uh, homepage. So um, as, as a test example, um, and in this particular case, they had tried quite a few learning methods before this one, and none of them had been successful, had done better than the humans who were selecting news articles by hand before this. Um, but using this system, um, they were actually to, possible to get a 25% relative lift or improvement in the click-through rate. So that's a big improvement. And so now it's used to handle thousands of requests per second. Okay, so uh, I'll skip this since I'm out of time. Um, and uh, so, so basically I tried to convince you that this is a challenging and interesting problem. Challenging, not necessarily unsolvable. Um, and I've tried to run through some of the main, some of the methods that have been useful in solving it. And so, stop there. <laughs>